Hey everyone, welcome back. Up next is a conversation with Eli Paley. Eli is the founder of the Mishpacha magazine. Mishpacha means family in Hebrew, and their audience is the Jewish ultra Orthodox community. It was great. Eli was super thoughtful. He raised points and questions that I had never thought of or entertained. I mean, look, to be honest, he's got a point of view that rarely enters into my mind, but I thought was interesting to seek out because it's just always in the news about how they're threatening the future of, of this country and how they're undermining the fabric of Israeli society. So I wanted to hear from, from someone within that community. And I think that you'll get something out of this conversation too. And just on a personal note, I want to say that given how they are portrayed as holding values that are very foreign to most, say, modern or secular people, I did feel like I was heading into perhaps some kind of alien <laughs> spaceship. I mean, we recorded this in their offices and I have to say it was totally normal. Uh, it looked like any office that you could think of, they had chairs, computers, furniture, the lighting is the same, uh, men and women working together. E even when in the studio where Ellie and I recorded, there was a woman called Shirelle and she helped with the audio of this. I spoke to her after all, again, a very bright woman. So my point is sometimes the gap between our perceived differences and the actual story is smaller than we think. So I hope that's true. And of course, I should say, of course, that a gap does remain between, say, what Elliot thinks about the world and I do, and therefore the point of these conversations. Let me know what you think in the comments below. It's always great to hear from the audience. Listening to what you guys have to say really does sharpen my thinking. And if you haven't already done so, please subscribe to wherever you listen to podcasts. The numbers keep going up and that is really, really cool to see. And I'm really thankful for all everyone's support. And lastly, if this conversation resonates with you, or you find something useful or it makes you think of someone else who might be interested in this kind of topic, then share it. Let, help me spread the word. Um, I'm trying to reach as many people as I can who are interested in this kind of stuff. Anyway, enjoy the conversation with Ellie. Let's get some water. How are you, Eli? Baruch Hashem, doing great. Yeah? Bikaot, do you want to do one shot or do you want to do this one shot? No, no, it's just one shot. One shot, okay. Yeah. Look, you know, it's, uh, my style is honestly just, you're talking to me, you know? <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm a recovering journalist and one of the mistakes I used to make um, in the beginning when I was doing the, the podcast was I was treating every episode like an interview. Mm -hmm. So I would prepare and I would, you know, have smart things to say and all that kind of stuff. And what I realized was that um, interviews are actually just tortured conversation, you know, because then it's, I'm, I'm in the, I take the form of someone that wants to extract information out of you, whereas a conversation is exactly mm -hmm. right. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm present and I'm listening to what you say and it's just so much. I liked it much better. Yeah, yeah. And it takes you. There is some advantages of doing it very Structured. Yeah, structure, but uh, in terms of conversation, I feel it's much more. Yeah, the yeah. dynamic is much better. And it's also, I actually get a sense for who you are, and you get a sense for who I am, and we get somewhere, you know? It's cool. And I'm obviously not the first one to stumble onto this, but anyway, so nice to meet you. Thank um, you. So listen, the, the reason, I, I really don't have an agenda other than to understand your community better, but the reason I... I sought you out was because this country right now is i don't know it, it, it's yeah you, you you smile you laugh but it's there's something going on where it's been no, in yiddish we call it the krechts which oh. is oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay you know as the jewish people always we smile you know when when rabbi akiva saw the the fox going out from what what is that? I saw that on Twitter yeah. on Tisha B'Av. What 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 was that whole story behind the fox and the? No, the story is that after the destruction of the second temple, Rabbi Kiv and some other sages came to see the destroyed 
a temple and destroyed city, and they saw a fox going out from the place of the Beit HaMikdash, the holy mm. temple, and the sages were crying. This holy place became such a place that uh, we see animals walking there, a mm. place that only the Kohen Gadol was allowed to go into the Kodesh HaKodeshim. And our Akiva looked at this and smiled and said, why are you smiling? And he said, because the prophet who said that the, 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 the temple will be destroyed, Beit HaMikdash will be destroyed, mm-hmm. he is the same one who said, Al Har Tzion Sheshamim Shualim Hilchubo. So if I saw Shualim Hilchubo, I also believe in the prophet that said, one day it will be rebuilt and recovered. So when we see a disaster, always we see something that, okay, there is... There is a process, there is something is going behind. Oh, wow. And I believe it's also relevant to the, what we are facing today. We are, we are all very, very sad and concerned about what's going on, but I believe, and i yeah, a very optimistic person, that maybe it's a new so, reset of our structure. And uh, So there's this, so what I was alluding to earlier was that there's this central tension that has been, has just exploded, I said, into the public domain, which is, what is Israel, right? Is Israel a Jewish country? Is Israel a democratic country? Can both those things coexist? Um, and, and obviously you are, you and the Haredi, the ultra-Orthodox community, on the spectrum of that definition, fall on the more, the, the classically religious side of of Judaism, right? Whereas uh, the, the so-called founders of this uh, country were on the more democratic, secular side. And... And, and and there's this element of demographics, right, where your your community is the fastest growing in the country, and now the people who um, who, who have who formed this country, who have governed this country, who have set the policy for this country for since its inception, inception, feel that it's turning. It's 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 this kind of I want my country back thing going on where, mm-hmm. and now you guys are the scapegoat for for everything, right? So if if there's any change that it's in your benefit, your favor, it's, oh my gosh, the country's going to hell and we're all going to live in a country that's of your making, in your image. And uh, it, it seems to me to be pretty, I don't know, it's, it's not healthy, I would say. So I want to know if all that stuff they said about you is true. You, you as in your community, right? What do you, what do you want? <laughs> what, what is it exactly that you want in your country? How, how do you envision this country you should look like? Okay, so I'll start with uh, my personal history. Yeah. Um, so my connection to the state of Israel started back uh, almost 100 years ago when my grandfather came from Lithuania, from Russia, to build yeshiva in the city of Hebron. Oh, wow. In 1924, it's almost... 100 year, and a year later, my great-grandfather came. He was a rabbi in the yeshiva and my uncle. So our family came to the state of Israel as part of the long mission of trying to rebuild Torah in Eretz Israel. Wow. Um, it started with the Talmidei Hagra uh, 300 years ago. They, they were the first Zionists who came to Israel with no, with, with no conditions, just because of the passion to to rebuild back the, the Jewish the Jewish uh, nation and Jewish state. Okay. Um, this is for my father's side. They were there till 1929, uh, till the big massacre, the Oraot Arpat. Wait, uh, just, just spell that out for anyone that doesn't know. What happened in 1929 in 1929 Hebron? was a big massacre uh, in many places in Israel. The Arabs, that was part of the tension between the Arabs and the Zionist movement. And the Hebron was one of the the, the wars, uh, was uh, pogroms and, and, and violence in many places in Israel and in Jaffa and Tiberias and some other places. But in Hebron was particularly tra- a tragedy because there was such a great relationship between the Jewish community and the Arab community, uh, the family Slonim, where they had a bank there, and all the Arabs on, on the business people were in touch with them. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden, one day, um, it turned, and uh, our family story was that my great-grandfather was asked to come to the shelter by the house of the family Slonim, mm-hmm. because this was considered a, 
secure place because everybody knew that everybody respect him everybody I'm talking about the Arab society and my great grandfather uh, decided that he want to stay home and what happened was that the people were by the house of Sloney most of them were murdered and killed whoa and, and uh, in a very um, crew crew like you can't imagine what happened not just they kill the people they, they even tor- tor- torture the people and rape the, the, the women it was uh, uh, very frightening were these the same people that did business and had good relations yeah, yeah. so just one day they turned and mm-hmm. wow um, and uh, our family survived because my great grandfather uh, stood in his home uh, do you know the, why he decided not oh to do it? so for years was a story like it was uh, a prophet how did he know that uh, yeah. he's going to survive and the real story was that he was suffering for asthma and he decided that he there is no way he can be in, in very crowdy crowdy home he won't survive he had, he had a very uh, hard asthma he, he passed away very young a few years later um, but uh, for our film then then we moved to Jerusalem and the famous yeshiva yeshivat Hevron in Yerushalayim which is today the, the largest one of the, the biggest yeshivot in the Haredi world mm-hmm. was the continuation of this uh, effort in uh, in the city of Hevron so always what I'm talking about my family and my heritage so we came to Earth Israel with a mission that we have we have a mission to rebuild the The, the 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 Jewish state or the Jewish the Jewish country mm-hmm. uh, to continue and to build to in Eretz Israel so I'm very deep into this root of of my my, my family my family uh, heritage for my mother's side she's my mother she was a Holocaust survivor she was a young girl by the Holocaust um, I find three years ago I went with my kids two of my youngest kids to Yad Vashem and Uh, the day before Tisha B'Av, and part of the visit was to to go over my grandmother testimonial. She gave like six and a half hours testimonial about her experience. She your, was your very grandmother. Good, my grandmother. She was a very great storyteller. So she spoke about her family, not just about the Holocaust. But then we find, and I was shocked to find, that my mother, her sister, and her mother was were already on a train to Auschwitz. So they survived Auschwitz. Over the war and at some point they took them to put them on a train to Auschwitz you know the, the cattle train with the people dying in and after a day or two of traveling um, the train was bombed and health of the train continued to the original destination and the second health was stuck there and after a day the the brought the train and took them from the other side to Vienna and this is this is uh, how we survive Wow so I am living with these two elements of my my genes or my history one is the passion of, of making sure the Torah will flourish and continue uh, here in the state of Israel yeah. and and in a way much much more before the establishment of the state of Israel and uh, and being a son of a Holocaust survivor, In the, in the deep meaning of Holocaust survivor, my mother, my great my grandmother and then my, also my grandfather. He was in concentric uh, camps, but he also survived. so the unit after the war. so she came here with two kids. Um, she left the world with having um, 20 grandkids. She lost a, a girl by the war, another sister of my mother. And when she passed away, she passed with over 100 grandkids. Wow. And endless number. I can't even count how many great grandkids she had. She passed in the age of 94. Yeah. So how do, you, how, do you, how do you make sense of that her- inheritance? Because on the one hand, your grandfather survived. They, they both survived by, essentially by luck. And one was a case of, wonderful relations th- according mm-hmm. to the way you tell it and then just one over a very short period of time it just becomes extremely hostile and and murderous and your on, and on your mother's side I mean I don't even know how to how to parse that and how do you make sense of how you came to be how you came to be in this world I think that uh, um, this part of our family history uh, made me maybe even living with a much stronger sense of a mission, meaning 
I'm here because I have a mission. I'm not here because I want to survive, and I'm mm-hmm. not here because I just want to have a good, a good life. And this is the way I grew up. My father was very active over his lifetime just to help people mm. in, in any manner. Give me, give me an example. Like what, what's, what, who was your father? Um, my father in, a, in a early, the early 60s. He was a young boy in yeshiva, and this is the days that, uh, that the new immigrants start to come from uh, North Africa, mm-hmm. Morocco, Yemen, Morocco, and other places. And that was the time when the clash between the religious and the new Zionist movement was very strong. Mm. And it's important to, to remind it or to remember it because to understand the tension between the Haredi and non-Haredi, we have to go back at least to the, to the days of the uh, establish, establishing of the state, but mm. also going back of even 200 and 250 years, the fight between the Enlightenment, Haskalah, and the religious community. So when when they came to Israel, and Israel was a new country, they were very concerned about how these people who are still devoted to the old religious life and tradition will affect the new secular socialist state. And the part of the Haredi trauma was those days when they forced people to leave the religious. They didn't offer them. They didn't suggest them. They didn't give them a choice. They forced people, they took, put people in camps, didn't allow them to have any access to Jewish education. And my father, and one, by the way, of the Rabbanim here in our publication, Rabbi Benachem Cohen, uh, were young people who went to the camps and were fighting with the guards there, sometimes with risking their lives because they were sometimes even shooting people who came to help those, uh, those uh, new immigrants and was trying their best to see how we can help these people, that their kids will continue to get a Jewish education. One of the stories that I heard a few years ago, I went to, uh, uh, to Mern, to Shiva, of some very famous family, and he was a brother-in-law of David Yosef, a Swiss, and he told me his story. <laughs> Ah. That's fine, that's fine. Okay. Okay. Keep going. <laughs> and so, uh, so he said that uh, when he was a young child, he was in one of these camps where yeah. they, they put these Moroccan people. And one day my father came there, was like maybe 19 or 20 years old. Yeah. And he came there and he saw the child running in the middle of the day, running out outside. So he went to his mother and said, why aren't you sending him to a school? And she said, because they forced us to send them to secular school. And I didn't come, I didn't came to Israel to give my kids secular education. We always, for, for years, we were praying and wishing to come to Israel and, and I can't give up. So I'm, I'd rather let them stay here and not go to a secular school. And my father said, I have yeshiva. Let them come with me. And the mother, without even blinking, she went to the room. She took the blankets and put some of the few clothes that he has. She tied it together, put it on his shoulder, and gave him to my father. My father took him to yeshiva. By the evening, the father came home, and he asked, where is David or Moshe? And she said, I don't know. A, 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 A rabbi came here, a young rabbi, and I liked him very much, and I sent uh, David with him to yeshiva and took over three weeks till the boy came back first time, so nobody knew where he is. So what you can learn from this story was, A, how passionate they were to find a solution for their kids, and they were even ready to give up the child without knowing if he will come back uh, 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 anymore. So that was my father's passion when, when he started to work, was an organization called Pe'ilim, they were running from camp to camp. He built, he opened yeshiva, he built yeshivot, he took kids to yeshivot. Many of them were later became big rabbis in Israel. Mm. Um, if, later. If I, if I channel my inner uh, Christopher Hitchens, do you know who that is? Mm. No, right. <laughs> of course not. No, he's a very, he was a very um, well-known atheist uh, writer. So that's one way to read the story. If I were him, I would read that story and think, uh, a country is trying to provide education that will 
help you, those young children um, integrate into uh, an economy, give them a chance for a better life. And these re- these religious conservatives are saying, well, no, I'd rather my child get, you know, this, um, let's say, archaic education of religion that is questionable whether it can actually help someone um, uh, be, a, be a functioning member of society. And that, that's this is the poison of religion that 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 people would go so far as to deny their children a chance for a better life um clinging to their own you know ancient beliefs and um and boy is not all that terrible and 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 in so far they like not even that they just she was so desperate for a religious education that she just gave her son away to a essentially a stranger and they didn't know where this person was for three weeks um what? So for, no, first I want to argue about the, 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 the case, meaning yeah. to send these kids to religious schools didn't mean to send them to Haredi school today. It was a regular school mm-hmm. with, with the regular curriculum and English and math, and, and, but, but, but the case was that they said if they will stay religious, not if they will go to religious school, if they will stay, they cut their payout, they took off their mm-hmm. kippah, mm-hmm. they forced them to be Mechalel Shabbat, they didn't mm-hmm. give them jobs if they will insist to continue right. the religious practice right. and this is a very scary uh, right. decision even your friend will agree yeah. because how far you are ready to go for it right. and what happened with the Yamanites for instance so from the same attitude you decided so for this child it's better to grow up by a father by a, by a parents in a kibbutz so they even they took kids from their parents and didn't give them back so, right. so that was, was part of the big tragedy until right. today if we want to understand the roots, why Haredim are so suspicious mm. about the country, so always we have to keep in mind that we have some trauma from the way that it was built, not just that people left the religious, that was one issue, that many people left the religious, and that's why Haredim start to build a, a strategy how we can segregate from the community to make sure that we won't lose our kids, because we believe that with all the respect to make sure that people be able to make a living, but we have a mission in life to make sure that the Jewish nation will continue, okay. that we will continue the history of over 300, 3,500 years. So this is part of their mission, but the tragedy that how far the, the, the founders of the country, some of the founders of the country were ready to go, uh, uh, put Haredim, and I always say we have to recover, we have to, to move forward, mm-hmm. but it's always a tragedy. I don't know whom, when you want to blame, who you want to blame today. But without understanding the roots, mm-hmm. we're missing something. Okay. I just give you just one, one another example. It's called the uh, Yaldei Tehran, the kids from Tehran. Mm-hmm. It was young kids, orphans, who lost their parents by the Holocaust. They came to Israel. Most of them came from Hasidic, rabbinic families. Some of them were kids of big rabbis and big. At Morim, and the state decided that they have to go to Kibbutzim. It was a big fight in Israel whether those kids will continue to get religious education as their parents who were murdered by the Holocaust wanted, or the state decided, no, 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 we want for them the best education, and that was a huge tragedy. Yeah, so, and, like, and it's and it's what good is the highest education if you if you destroy someone's spirit and soul. Right, if you if you rip someone out of their family and you you rip them out of the values that they're accustomed to, and th- those kids were crying. That's a trauma, and, uh, right? Yeah, yeah. Th- they're crying. And uh, nobody was listening to them. It was like a political agreement that I think eighty five percent went to kibbutzim, five mm-hmm. percent went to uh, Aguda, and ten percent went to Mizrahi, yeah. and that was a tragedy. And and there's something, I think this is the one of the dangers of um, atheism is that you you rationalize everything. You say, look. You know, he, human robot. You know, we'll just wh- whatever culture you came from, whatever backward culture you came mm-hmm. from. We'll, f- we'll forget all the any of the positives. We'll just we'll calculate this and say, look, okay, you 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 seem to have an aptitude for math. Okay, we'll we'll put you in a in a scenario that optimizes that, and we'll disregard all the sort of emotional, psychological, co- or even spiritual components to your existence. Yeah, I, I could just give you. I think it's, it's very relevant to our conversation, even to understand the situation today. Mm-hmm. Meaning. There is some challenges and concerns. Oh, it's now it's okay? <laughs> it's fine. Hmm? No one's looking for our pretty faces now. <laughs> anyway, so, uh, so you were I, saying... I find the similarity to a very current uh, challenge, which is 
kids who are leaving the Haredi society, leaving, leaving Haredi society, we call them today Chozer B'She'ela, uh-huh. kids who drop their right. Jewish life, and there is organizations who are helping them. Yeah. And one of, and I'm in my foundation, I didn't speak yet about my foundation, and on foundation also we are focusing very much on the welfare of young Haredi kids, mm-hmm. trying to help. And one of the challenges is the same attitude that was by the by the establishment of the state. People say, okay, if you are coming from a Haredi family mm-hmm. and finally you left, make, let's, let's try to make sure that you will get a new life. And part of giving you a new life is to disconnect you from the old life, including from your family. Mm-hmm. Meaning, you, I'm not saying that we're pushing you. Some, some may be even pushing them, but even without pushing them, at least we encourage them to say, okay, Leave aside the family that you're coming from. Leave aside the poor life. Leave aside, mm-hmm. and let's try to rebuild a new life. And it's not working. It's not working because you can't take from a child, you can't take from a person, his family, his parents, yeah. no matter what kind of parents. Is. And, and I'm very happy today to see that some of this movement really understand that one of the biggest challenges, whether you are staying religious or not religious, is to make sure that the kids and the family will be connected. And so, that it, this is really reflecting the same attitude mm-hmm. that some of these organizations really felt that as long as we will help you to really delete and forget everything that you're coming from, no, you can't, because this is part of my life, part of my culture, part of my, my, my soul, and, 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 you, and you can't uh, just... So, so what, what is... Let's just start from all the way down, yeah. all the way down on the ground floor. What, what, what do... I know Haredim is a sort of a, a broad term, but w- what do the ultra-Orthodox believe, metaphysically? So a God exists, yeah? Oh, for sure. No, but <laughs> this is not. I don't know. No, but this is not. <laughs> this is not the definition of uh, of Haredim. Uh, I think what uh, the main. Um, but, but wait, but wait. I just want to hang on, hang on because I think it's relevant. The God part. So mm-hmm. what is this God? First of all, is this a uh, is this a personal God? You can you can talk, speak with this God? Do you, yeah, do you have yeah, an answer? Absolutely. We just read this parasha, and I recommend you to go, maybe you did it, to go over this parasha and to see uh, how God, by the Torah, uh, described the relationship between him and the, and the Jewish nation as the chosen people, that he loved them, he cared about them, he, he took care about them. And so we see God as a very personal, um, personal God, who, who really find us and, 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 and chose us for a mission of the world. And the mission is really to bring the presence of God to the world. Mm-hmm. And the way that it's done is that, yes, um, in just in the previous parasha, we said, Umi goi gadol asher lo Elohim krovim elav ka Hashem Eloheinu bechol koreinu elav. There is, is there any big nation who is so, who has a close God? This is the definition. Elohim Krovim, a close God, and the close God means that he's always there to listen to our prayers. So we believe that there is a constant relationship between God, and not, not just to create the world uh, or, or create the, the universe, that he is the one that uh, wants us together with him to make the world as a better place. Okay, and this God that loves the Jews has, has carved out... so. so um, the earth is populated by humans, but there's this very narrow class of humans called the Jews that have a special mission to bring God to the world. Mm-hmm. And is is in the uh, ultra orthodox understanding of this is the is the Jew properly defined? Is there a a one definition that fits what a Jew is and isn't? Hmm. Interesting. Um, by Haredim or by religious people, so the, the only definition of being right Jew, I would call it, not being a Jew. Being a Jew is uh, bio- biological. If you were born to a Jewish mother, so you're a Jew, whether you are religious or not religious. But uh, to be, to be in, in, the, in, the, in, in the real sense of being a Jew, meaning to fulfill your commitment to this relationship with God, which means to fulfill your commitments to keep and to observe Torah and Mitzvot, the commands of God. Okay. And the uh, and the Torah was written over many many years, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, so sorry, let me take a step back. Um, according to the tradition, the the ultra orthodox Jews believe that this was a book 
dictated from God to Moses, right? And to the Jewish nation. And then therefore to the to the Jewish nation. That was the, the, the first the five books of Moses and then afterwards the the, the following books were written by prophets and then mm-hmm. after that the rabbis. The sages, right? yeah. Okay. So and and what, what what confuses me, which is why I ask about the definition of a Jew, is that there's just there's such a broad within the whole Jewish nation, there's a whole broad spectrum of what is a Jew. Like for example, you have the Karaites. Mm-hmm who don't follow any rabbinical law at all. They say mm. it's... Oh, am I wrong? They follow some. They, they have their own rabbinical guidance. <laughs> <but yeah. laughs> Just not those rabbis. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, perfect. That's, that's essentially what, what, what Judaism is. It's like, just well, you follow my rabbi, it's not that one. Right? There, there's a lot of that. Yeah, but it's, it's a very philosophical question because uh, we know that uh, Judaism in general or, or, or the rabbinical Judaism is really encouraging a debate and encouraging different opinions. And the question is, where is the border? When are you still part or considered part of this right. conversation and, and there is a legitimacy for diversity and different opinions right. and different in terms of beliefs? So some people believe that as long as you're keeping the, the practical rules, you can you can be you know maybe more rationalist like Rambam, mm-hmm. or you can be more mystical or what, what, what some other people say that even in your beliefs there is some rules, but in general I think that the common agreement is that uh, or the common understanding is that if in order to keep at least based on our history, in order to keep to be part of this uh, um, circle of Jewish life, you have to make sure that. Keeping Torah mitzvot is part of your life. So l- let me let me ask this question, I guess, in a different way. I, I, let, just following with what you said, right? So would you would you say that the Jew today is the same Jew a thousand years ago, two thousand years ago, three thousand years ago? Would you would you be, would you be able to use the same markers to identify who the Jew is and who the Jew isn't um, across time? So yeah. So the answer will be yes. But, and I'll, I'll explain, meaning for sure the closest way of life that I can see that, that there is correlation between the way that people live today and, le- and lived 1,000 years ago and 2,000 was, I think, the same elements, meaning that studying Torah mm-hmm. is your core mission in life. Eilu dvarim she'en lahem shi'ur. We say it every morning. That, uh, and you see part of the definition of Haredim or, or, or the way, if you want to describe Haredim, is putting the value of studying Torah, not the value of keeping, observant, keeping uh, uh, the Jewish uh, rules, the Jewish law. Yeah. Making this as part of their life, which translated into their elementary education, yeshivot and koilalim, this is something that uh, uh, I think you can, you can see it over the, over the years, whether people were worked or didn't work, always studying Torah was a Jewish value. Okay. Even before the world even discovered the importance of, of uh, literacy and, 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 and learning. Right, I mean, even Jewish kings of old, right, they, they would sit and study. Always. Right. Always. Right. Th- this is one element. The other element is your, the commitment that you have to keep the Jewish law. Now, I think this is the similarity between Jewish today and 1,000 years ago and 2,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. If you ask me if someone from the Mishnaic time, from the you know the, the second the century, will will meet today a Haredi rabbi and and they will find ah we are similar no they're not similar they have different culture different language different mm-hmm. uh, way of life, so for sure in a way Haredim today is is a reflection of modernity meaning the mm-hmm. way. Meaning the essence, the main values are, from my perspective, or, or let's put it the opposite. For sure, people are living today not in the, the way of observing Torah, whether they're Haredim or I'm not talking just about Haredim, Orthodox people, even mm-hmm. more Orthodox, mm-hmm. people that the Torah and mitzvot are the center of life. For sure, they are more, uh, have more in common with the people 1,000 to 2,000 years ago than people today that they have Jewish identity by, I don't know, tikkun olam or believing in the, <laughs> you know, revival of the Jewish people, uh, they for sure, bec- because the, the, the being a Jew till 300 years ago was very one, one definition, whether you are, right. have commitment to the Jewish halakha or don't have commitment. What halakha means, how flexible halakha can be, we can argue, but yeah. for sure, that was the main, the main attitude and the main value. Okay, but you, to just to zoom back into the present moment, 
you can understand uh, let me ask you this is a question yeah but can you understand then the concern that secular people people that don't necessarily they don't study torah all day um they don't keep all the laws but identify themselves as jewish um and you know what what's what's fascinating about all this and why i think i i I, li- I insist on starting on this on the, in, in metaphysics because mm-hmm. we act in a given way to l- in order to lead the best life possible, however you define that, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That is the point of action. Mm-hmm. And so Judaism is one set of ideas that say, okay, act this way and you'll get closer to God, essentially, right? In this parasha, we said, Ve'ata Yisrael, ma Hashem Elohecha Doresh Mi'imach, what God wants from you, you know, to, to, to keep uh, and to love him and whatever, for, you, for your own sake, letov lach. Ma Hashem Elohecha Doresh Mi'imach, at the end of the day, all he wants from you right. is to make sure that your life will be a better life. Someday. Which is, which is there's, there's such wisdom in that because your best life is the, is, uh, you know, by by definition, the best life for everyone else, mm-hmm. right? The better person you are, mm-hmm. the happier you are, the more giving and loving you are, obviously you want m- as many of those kinds of people you want in the around Absolutely. the world, right? So, so, w- which is, which is why it gets so interesting because the claim is, everyone makes this claim, but also specifically for the ultra-Orthodox is, we know the best way forward in life and any deviation or any any uh yeah any deviation from our standard is is suboptimal it's a it's a, it's a judgment it's like a, okay all the rest of you you don't really know what you're doing <laughs> <laughs> right but by the way secular people make everyone makes that judgment then we all look at each other and say wow you know maybe you should cut that beard man uh, you know <laughs> it's it's just a lot of maintenance, just, mm-hmm. you know, right? Whatever, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm making a silly joke, but mm-hmm. but the certainty that comes with the religious mindset of we know what the answer is, that's that's the scary part for a secular person to say, well, like, let's discuss this. <laughs> um, I agree. I remember that uh, a few years ago I led a tour of uh, yeah. a few uh, leaders and business people to the uh, one of the Haredi cities. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mudin elite, like you know, to meet, to see the real life, to see the people. We even had uh, uh, a supper by each each of the groups where the supper by Haredi family. So to see the family, their food, the, the the way, the kids, the family. Yeah. And I remember that the, by the end we had the conversation, and one of the questions that we were asked, people were very impressed to see how modest they are living and and and, and happy families. Yeah. It was really, you know, they have many stereotypes st- stereotypes about Haredim, and, and they were really fine that even people that consider living in a very low uh, low level, they're living in a very, you know, the the, the maintenance of their home looks nice, and and and, yeah. and they love and they love uh, decoration and the, the, the and, and good food and and. And uh, I remember by the end, so one of the people asked me, you know, what bothers me, I was very impressed to see it, and it's really fascinating, but I, I really bothered why Haredim don't take responsibility for their brothers. Meaning you're living your own life, but we have challenges. Mm-hmm. Army, economy, mm-hmm. why you're not taking this seriously? And I said health in a joke, but it wasn't really a joke. I said, I'm not sure that at that stage you want Haredim to take responsibility. Because for Haredim to take responsibility means exactly what you said. Ah, so you want to take responsibility? So for me, I have to make sure that you will live the right life. So maybe it's better to live in such a status quo that, you know, let us build our own life. Let's keep a dialogue without trying to force uh, our way of life. And I really believe that this is reflects the way that Haredim see. Meaning Haredim don't have any... I can say it in general. Maybe there is few. You are a Jew. Uh, you know, no, they don't have any. You, you said, no, you, you, you want me to go join in the army? Oh, okay, sure. No, I'm saying, no, they don't have any. No, any I'm joking, but that, yeah. that, that's, a fun, that's an interesting argument. I, I hadn't actually considered that. It's like, if you really want us to hold the guns, yeah. okay. be careful. No, not even guns. <laughs> you really want our voice to be heard? Mm-hmm. Okay, so we have priorities. So first we have to make sure that we'll be a country, but this is not the way the Haredim are living. And this is, part of, in, in my perspective, part of the beauty or the balance of the Haredim. They really deeply believe in their way of life, 
but they don't try, they don't even have any, any ambitions to oppose their way of life of other people. Meaning, on one hand, it's a challenge because they look at other people and said, we are living right, you are living wrong. Mm-hmm. But all they want is, let us continue focusing on what we are doing. And that's part of the tension that we see today. People said, but why don't you care about the big picture? And I said, because for Horatio, there is a different interpretation of what does it mean to care about the rest. I mean, you said, mm. care, can you make sure that the GDP will, will, will continue to grow? And I said, no, this is not my highest priority. So if you want us to care, I do care. And the way I care is to make sure that my kids will continue and I'm ready to sacrifice and I'm ready to give up many of, of the opportunities in my life because I want to make sure that the Jewish nation will continue without forcing my agenda on other people. The, the issue, though, I, if, I'm, if I'm now going to take the stance of a staunch secular person, would be to say, okay, fine, fair enough. I see where you're coming from. But we still live in this country together, and your sacrifices, your way of living, um, are to your benefit. But we are, you know, worrying about the GDP, and we are worrying about mm-hmm. the defense of this country for yours as well. It's not just for us, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's for everyone. Um, and and if if I'm honest, I I I have my sympathies lies lie with the the people who make the sacrifices for everyone, right? Not just for their own narrow community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So h- how how do we find that balance forward? Because you can't, you need a voice. You need to participate, right? That it wouldn't be fair otherwise. And it's important to hear, it's important to hear your concerns of what, what you guys want and what you don't want. Um Anyway, sorry. I think, th- I, think th- I think I just asked you, you a question. You made, yeah, <laughs> you, you made a point. So, so, um, you're definitely touching, I think, uh, the biggest challenge that we have today, and, and I think the tension that we see today and yeah. big, is really reflecting this this question, but I just want to go back. So mm-hmm. I'll start with my, my story. Like Almost 11 years ago, when my father passed away, um, I was very concerned about it. For years, I was very concerned about the issue of how we Haredim and non-Haredim can live together. Yeah. I think this is for the, for the sake of the Jewish people. We can't allow, you know, we have two great an amazing communities. I think the Haredi community is an amazing community. Right. The secular community is an amazing community. Each of them has so many very unique added values to to rebuild the future of the Jewish people. Yeah. And I was bothered for many years there, but there is totally disconnected between these two, I always said, these two big, my, my two big loves. I love the Haredi society. I grew up in the Haredi society. I raised my kids in the Haredi society and I want to continue this. And on the other hand, I feel that I'm very, very much into the, the, the session of, of the rebuild of the state of Israel. Yeah. Again, as a son of Holocaust survivor, I can't be uh, apathic to, to the miracle of the rebuild of the Jewish people. Yeah. And I can live in these two worlds. I mean, I can live with the, with the conflict of, yes, but uh, as, as some prices in Jewish values. But uh, that was my main concern. I said, we have to find a way how we are going to live together not because I was concerned about the GDP or the economy of Israel. I was much more concerned, in a deeper concern, about the future of the Jewish people. Because I believe that the, the Orthodox society in general, and the Haredi society in particular, have a crucial role on the future of the Jewish people. Meaning, yes, it's important to, to have a great GDP. It's important to have a strong army. But we have to have a soul. We have to have a mission. You have mm. to have what for. And I think that having a society that's so much still committed to the original Jewish values, it's crucial for the Jewish people. Crucial not that everybody should adapt this model. In order to be able to live with this diversity, and I believe that the, in the next decades we will see Judaism is going to be in different versions, which mm-hmm. is something that, but we're still in, into an experiment. This new experiment of having a new way of life for Jewish people, it wasn't done yet. Even after 75 years of the state of Israel, I'm not sure that if we will take out the religious element of the, of the Jewish people, you know, let, let's say that the Haredi will decide that they're going to the diaspora, nobody likes them here, you know, they're not going to the army and they will go, I don't know, to Uganda or to the United States and try to mm-hmm. rebuild their communities. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure. And, and, and again, if the religious people will leave, I'm not sure that the state of Israel will continue even to survive. 
Because what happens is that, yes, people are doing great in business and high tech and army and technology and science. But here comes the question. And if you ask me what, what's behind the main concern of people who are protesting today is not the issue what will happen to, to, to judicial reform or to the, even to the Israeli economy. Mm-hmm. They are facing the big questions where Israel is going to be oh, in, yeah. in oh, 10, yeah. 20, 30 years. And you know that's true because even the, the politicians who oppose right now, they, 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 they oppose some of these reforms before this became an issue were in favor it. Mm-hmm. Right, yeah. it's just who's do, who's doing the reforming, right? Who's mm-hmm. doing? Who's the one behind manipulating? Uh, absolutely, and, and, and it like, like took me, you know, few few weeks that I start to have deep conversation with people from all yeah. all sides to understand that the issue is not this or uh, this, this part of the question. Right. And I call it in in an essay that I published in our publication Mishpacha. I call it it's not about democracy; it's about demography. Yeah, but I want to say that even. My point is that not the issue is not just that the issue is not the judicial reform or the issue is more Haredim. I'm saying even put aside Haredim. Mm-hmm. We are facing a crisis. The, the next generation, after 75 years of the state of Israel, I find many of my good friends are asking themselves, are, is my kids are going or my grandkids are going to live in Israel? Now, their excuse is why you are not sure they're going to live in Israel because the Haredim, because the demographic, right, because right. the economy. I'm not sure that this is the only question. I, I, I agree that this is part of the concern, but there is a deeper question. So what is that and question? And even people who serve the army when they are leaving the state of Israel, many of them sending their kids to a public or non-Jewish education, and many of them are assimilated, assimilated meaning did the state of Israel really solve the problem of making sure the continuation of the Jewish people? I'm not sure about it. And I'm not sure about it. Or, or I can say based on, on, on the, what, what, what we're facing today and seeing the world, the high rate of assimilation in the world. And you have to know that people who are coming to Israel are in the highest risk of high rate of assimilation. People that moved to Meaning, Israel? Meaning, pe- Israelis who are living in Berlin, or Los a- LA, oh, okay. or okay. A- any other places, yeah. the rate of their assimilation is higher than the regular American or, or European Jew. Okay, so, so I think it would be very profitable because there's, a, there's an obvious disconnect between what you guys are buying and selling versus what everyone else is buying and selling. And... What are the values, what are the things that, you said, okay, observance of Torah and Jewish law, but there must be some sort of value that then translates into being a Jew, and then those values ought to be, they have to serve some kind of real-world purpose. Absolutely. Right? Otherwise, who cares? So what are those values that you think you stand for that everyone else can get on board with. No, no, uh, absolutely, and I agree with you, and I'll get to this point. I just want to go back oh, to my sorry. to my decision. So yep. my so my concern is someone who grew up in the Haredi society and they love the Haredi society, mm-hmm. and I said, you see almost two different, the auton- autonomy of two, almost two different nations, and, and, and they're getting, when I was a child, we lived in a mixed neighborhood. Whenever we lived in, whether in Jerusalem, the old city, for years in Ashdod, always we lived together, religious and not religious people. Yeah. When I went to a school, so it was a religious school, but the kids in my school were from all sectors of the Haredi world, it was Hasidic and Sephardic and Chabad and Breslev and, and Lithuanian, etc. And even by the Haredi city, it's not anymore. Today, Haredi are living in a segregation. Everybody, first, they're living in a segregate neighborhoods, so you can... You, and and, and, and in, e- even among the Haredim, so if you are some specific, not just Hasidic, a specific Hasidic, so you will, right. you can, you can born and die without, without having any interaction with, with someone from out of your sector, almost, almost without any interaction. Oh my God. Which is frightening. Yeah, it is. It that's, is frightening. But that's really going back uh, By the way, I just, years. I just met a matchmaker, Shad Khanim, to... And amazing people who are dealing with some some crisis in the Hasidic world of elder people who have a hard time to find Shiduch. And they said part of the problem is that today, if you are Hasid Gu, you won't take a girl from Vizhnitz. And if you are Vizhnitz, you won't take from Buyan. And then 
if there is there is some balance or, or misbalance between between the genders so the problem is that all you want to take only from your sector and subsector and subsector which becomes a problem so as I said when I grew up uh, we lived in a way that we are part of the state by the way when my when I was a child almost all of all of the Haredim after yeshiva and few years in Koilel went to work and one when they went to work they went to the army mm-hmm. I myself went to the army my father went to the army oh, wow so th- that was like a given and today it's not a case today it's not a case so when you see how we're getting apart Haredim and non Haredim it's really a big a big threat and a big challenge of the state of Israel so when I started my foundation I said we have to do something to build a connection between the two yeah. the, the two parts and again as I said my point was that You know we are facing the miracle of rebuild the Jewish nation or the Jewish life we are still in the experiment the experiment it's not over yet 75 years and even 100 years or 150 years it's a very short time in in, in a history perspective mm-hmm. and you can see the trends and when I'm talking to my friends today most of their concern is I'm not sure that my kids are Of my grandkids will live in Israel but you said you said that they use uh, the dem- uh, demographics as a cover for something deeper that the, I, I believe that they have a real concern about the demographic yeah but if you want to rule to look much deeper I'm saying this is part of the concern so what is the deeper concern Jewish identity were we able really to give our kids so it, by, by the the first 75 years we're still fighting to To build to fight to, to to protect the state security so we, we had a sense of mission the sense of mission is gone we're flourishing we have a great economy we, we we are more or less doing well with our enemies and now the question is what for why a young guy who can live in Berlin and in LA and San Francisco and Toronto will stay in Israel and and not just for um, negative reasons in other words like Um, dissemism or whatever. right exactly right yeah, and, and right. that's and that's the challenge and I feel like there has to be a positive vision toward to, to being a Jew right and, 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 and I think this is right now if, if I have to to pinpoint what what's the real crisis mm. the real crisis is a meaning and the real crisis is a partnership meaning okay we want our kids to live here we see the Haredi the people who are making the Uh, the future of Israel something that we are really afraid that it's not going to be something that we want to live yeah but I want to ask the positive question what are the conditions to build a real partnership between religious people I t- just told one of my friends you know that they were again accusing the Haredim that because of you and and the, the country is going to become a religious country mm-hmm. and, and and poor country and so on and so on and so on and I said I want to say one thing you know you're criticizing our system and education system in Ishivot I know that you are asking yourself if your kids will stay in Israel. I don't have this question. I am sure that my kids and my grandkids will continue to stay in Israel no matter what the conditions will be. Because we, we did something in our educational system to, to create a real commitment to, to live to Eretz Israel, to Jewish state. You see people from all over the world, especially Orthodox people, we don't need Taglit, sending thousands of kids every year to seminary girls, boys to yeshivas, young couples who are staying in Israel for years to learn Torah. So they see Israel as a center of the Jewish life. Mm-hmm. And even successful people send in their kids for one, two, three, sometimes even five, seven years because they see Israel as a center of, of Jewish, Jewish identity. And, and, and there's something to what you say because I think most polls show that um, the more religious you are, the happier you are. Like, in other words, when you say that your kids and your grandkids are going to live here, you're certain of that, it's because you, you, you can show them that there's a real benefit to living here, right? If, if, I'll, I'll just give you one anecdote as an example. So you, ma- you mentioned matchmaking. Mm-hmm. There's a show on mm-hmm. Netflix called um, Jewish Mat- Matchmaking. I heard about it, yeah. Okay. Um, and so they, so they go through a whole bunch of uh, people who are looking for a partner. And um, it's mostly secular Jews, and they just don't have their shit together. They are just all over the place, you know, coming up with silly you know, requirements for a partner. 
and then there, they, they uh, she, the matchmaker she speaks to one um, Orthodox woman, and she's so grounded and calm, and she's like she's like surrendered her faith to God. Look, if it's not this one, then another one. But just so long as I uphold my values, so long as I continue to be a good person, things will work out for me in the end. Like that, that's the, I'm paraphrasing, mm-hmm. but that's kind mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. the that's the spirit that she embodied. And it was just so rational, the way, like, it was so down to earth of like, look, what makes, what makes a good partnership? Respect between a man and a woman, whatever it is, like love in the house, you know? And it just... Having the same goal. Yeah. Raising a family. Right, right. Goals. Sharing the same values, right? All, all that. Besides and just having good time. And exactly. And when, like, and the, and the secular types are saying, you know, one has to have nice eyebrows, uh, you know, um, one has to like guns, uh, things that just, you wouldn't even enter your mind if you think like, okay, I want to seek a partner. These are not the, the they're nowhere near on the on the top of the list, right? Mm-hmm. So so there there is something to there is something to this the the religious life that seems to work in 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 the world in the and world. By the way, there is something in the not religious that seems to work very much and, so. And now the challenge is really <laughs> it's how that GDP. This, <laughs> how can we have this conversation? Yeah. That, that's exactly my point. Yeah. And and, and yeah. I'll just uh, refer to the example you spoke about couplehood, matchmaking, yeah. and mm-hmm. shiduchim. Mm-hmm. Haredim have a very special model that from people from outside, it's really hard to understand that it works. Well, okay, but it works. It works. But it's nice to get drunk and, you know, <laughs> it works. Have fun. And I remember one of my closest friend, um, he was with me, he was witnessing when, when one of my kids went through a shiduch. Mm-hmm. And he saw the process, the way he had, at that, that time he had three kids that were not married. One of them were in China, very successful in business. Uh, his daughter were, were in England, mm-hmm. dating with, the, I think, a non-Jew guy, but were also very successful in, in the academia and university. And by the way, finally, he passed away uh, not long ago, but finally, I think a few years ago, one of his kids uh, uh, got married and they got two grandkids from a convert uh, a Chinese woman. But, okay. But, you know, they, they build a family. They looked at me, and I, I'm a father of six kids today. I'm 58 years old, and I'm grandfather of 10.3 kids, <laughs> uh, grandkids. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I remember that he was with me, by the time that I w- went through the process of of, uh, of uh, trying to find out about a specific uh, date for my son that later they got married. Yeah. And he was really shocked. And he said, you know, I looked at my kids and I see how they are struggling in their, their w- you know, the, the world of dating. And by you, um, w- w- what he liked so much was uh, the, first the due diligence. Meaning, <laughs> you're not going to a date before a real due diligence. And because we are very community-style mm. community, <laughs> okay? Mm-hmm. So it's very easy even to get information. I want to get information about these families. So, I know, uh, you know, in two, three efforts, I will find people that I know right. and trust and they know them. And it's, on, it's multi-layered, so, right? Because it's, it's on, the, on the, the couple themselves, but also on the, on the parents. The parents, the, the family. family. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, and, and so the, the, the due diligence process, meaning mm-hmm. before I'm sending my young boy and my young girls to date with someone, I will do, not him. I will do the due diligence. Right. And that makes more sense because you've already been through it. Yeah. You know what are the things you have to look for. And also, I didn't meet her by a club and I was half drunk. I'm going to date after that we find out that we're sharing more or less the same values, same family style, Mm -hmm. as I Mm -hmm. mentioned. Mm -hmm. There are Hasidic. What kind of Hasidic? We have to make sure that it's really matching my, my lifestyle. Yeah. And then when the young couple goes, always there is a high chance that the match will work because everything around works. Now the question is in terms of chemistry, right. whether they like or not. But they're not going to dance or for clubs or you know for years. They're very focusing in this four, five, six, seven, this is the average of, of a regular Lithuanian dating. By Hasidish it's even less. But let's say by our community, which right. I, I the Lithuanian, the Yeshivot. Right. So it takes between four to five, six dates to make a decision. Wow. So when they are going to date, they're very focusing. They are coming just to find out if they, they, they really like each other, mm-hmm. if they share, the, they have the same values, meaning her expectation, his expectations. So it's a very focused and the model works. Yeah. Sometimes it doesn't work. Okay. 
and, no, and there the, is also also divorce. I also I love the logic because you know we secular leftist types tend to think that you know the the, the uh, what what defines humans is so the, the the boundaries of the borders are ever expanding. But actually, no, like we, we're still the same culture now than we were a thousand years ago, or even almost fifty thousand. Whatever, however far back it goes, and so there really aren't that many parameters that you should be examining when you're thinking about the person you want to spend the rest of your life with. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's and it's great that there's a, a sort of a council of, council of elders who've already been through this so you have to know course, what to look for. You have the family. And even the young couple, they're coming with a very holy mission. We're going to build a Jewish life. We're not going mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. have good time together. Yes, it, it is important to have good time together, but they're coming and asking themselves, I am... You know, today, my one of my nieces is going to get married today. And you see how serious... Today? I, today, yeah. Oh, wow. And, and, <laughs> and, and next week, another one. <laughs> uh, and, and you see how serious they're going into this process, mm-hmm. meaning it's coming with a very holy mission and really trying to focus on the mission. I, we see ourselves as, some, as the parents are going to raise kids. And what are our Jewish values? Are you going to study or not going to study Torah? And what the balance between right. studying and not studying? And I think that it's it's really filtering all the, the, the you know, we, we know that the chemistry between genders, men and women, has so many elements of, mm-hmm. of, of uh, appeal and, and sexuality, trying to eliminate them to the, really to the minimum and really giving you an opportunity to focus for a moment of the human being, the person, not, mm. not, not everything around. And I think this is an example of, in, in my vision, what I would like to see in the future, when I spoke about what can be the contribution of the Haredi society to the rest of the Jewish people, it's not just, okay, we have nice model for our lives and please support us so we can maintain and continue. No, we have to participate in the conversation and, and see and learn, by the way, even learn from models. And, and, and again, I believe that there is also very interesting and good models of couplehood between non Haredi people. I don't think that Haredi, the only people, the only people who can really make a nice, mm. good couplehood. And I have many good friends that, that we can really see how they are building the family and, mm-hmm, and taking mm-hmm. care about each other. Mm-hmm. But Haredi should participate in the conversation, not just to take care. And I think the legitimacy of having your own life, and that back to the question you spoke about, G, 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 GDP, no? GDP. GDP, sorry. <laughs> Uh, talking about JDP is understanding that, yes, your legitimacy to live in a special style is relevant as long as you are going to contribute something for right. it to the Jewish people. Right. And I think Haredi people have so much to contribute in their community models, family models, education models. I just uh, had a conversation last week with one of the researchers in our institute. We funded in yeah. the Haredi Institute of Public Affairs. And he is now applying to get uh, like a huge budget to do a study to try to find interesting models that exist in the Haredi society and see are they how can we make them scalable or relevant to the other people. Like we have the free loan system. We have so many interesting models that exist. And by the way, just give one example of the Torah. Haredi have no problem of retiring and think, okay, so what am I going to do with my life? Because the passion for an average Haredi person is whenever he has free time, he wants to study Torah. Mm -hmm. So what you can see, people are like, (coughs) when they're getting to this point that they finally, finally retired, people are working, they're running to to the Bet Midrash and sitting and learning and, and really flourishing. Now we understand the world in 10, 20 years from now, we will have much more, you know, still today we're struggling with extra time. What will happen with the AI, what will, will happen to us with the AI and the technology that we, the crisis will be, people will ask themselves what I'm going to do with right, my free time. Right, right. And there is a community <laughs> who is very intellectual oriented, who loves studying and create a culture of learning and Maybe this is something that we can offer to other people. Again, not to offer them to be religious. The passion of studying and learning, the passion of always as a life mission to continue to learn. And my dream and my mission is to see how we can really create 
a conversation or a partnership between Haredim and non-Haredim, not just in the areas that Haredim have their own strengths. I agree that the conversation should be also talking about the economy and the security, all the other issues, but I think the conversation should start with coming with appreciation what each of the partners brings to the table and not to look. And, and I think the main problem sometimes with policy makers regarding Haredi society that they're saying, okay, you know, you have yeshivot, you have, I, I, know, I, don't know, I don't know what you're doing, but please make sure that you're going to get, uh, to, to go to work. And I said, oh, before, I agree. We have to make sure to find the best opportunities to let people to participate in the work field and, and, and do their best and, and, and flourish and whatever. Yeah. But please don't forget what they're bringing to the table that it's even relevant, not just for the Jewish people, but even relevant for the economy. Because when Haredi comes with his passion and way of thinking, he brings something to the table. You know, today, everybody appreciates diversity. And I said, once we will appreciate what Haredi can bring to the table, we will get much more than just making sure that, okay, I don't care, I don't care about what you're doing, but let's make sure that you will do something uh, so, productive. So what, what are the things that the Haredi bring to the table? What are those values that should be more, more effectively communicated to the world? Um, first, the sense of giving, chesed, volunteering. I think Haredi society, and this is also have to do with the conversation, why Haredi were not going to the army, which is a very sensitive topic, and, 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 and really part of the tension that we have is that we, o- over the years, we agree that we are, you know, we'll let you Haredi stay the way we're living, and, 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 and please don't get into our field, meaning go to the army. That mm-hmm. The agreement wasn't just, okay, we will let you study and learn. We want to build the army and, and the public arena the way that we wanted to, re- to build, so you Haredi stay aside. Mm-hmm. It can't be anymore because, again, we're talking about big numbers. So I think Haredi, I'll give you just one example. Um, I have a good friend that is a secular journalist. And uh, one day we spoke about my wife. My wife, she's a psychologist. She went to Tel Aviv University. And I said, even us that we are like consider more open-minded Haredi family, when she went to Tel Aviv University to do her master's degree and then uh, the training of uh, being a therapist, psychologist, so she, she got to, to know uh, secular friends from her class we became very close friends and she really appreciated them and she said listen I met friends uh, secular ladies really with people with values people and I really appreciate it so I said it to my friend and I said even us that we are very open minded Haredi family when she was really working or studying together closely with those people she even she learned to appreciate things that she don't see on, on, on the day to day mm-hmm and this guy, he's a very famous secular journalist. He said, Ellie, can you please introduce me to these secular people? That was his reaction. When I said that she met secular people who are people with values, and, and he said, can you please, and he's, by the way, one of the big fighters against Haredim. That was his reaction. Meaning you, that he didn't believe it? He said, no, I, see, I looked at the secular society and I don't see them as people with values as you are seeing. Interesting. That's A. Okay. And B, he said, and you know what makes the only way that the only reason why you see by the secular society, and again, I'm quoting someone, I don't want to quote, I didn't get his permission to quote his name, mm-hmm. so I'll tell you afterwards his name. Mm-hmm. But he said, the only reason why we still have values, family values, volunteering in our society is because we have a lot of people with, which we call them the Tlashim. People are coming from the more Zionist religious community, and there is like 30, 40% of them who are becoming secular, yeah. and they are helping us to make sure that our, because they're coming with their values that they grew up in their society, so when they are joining our society, even giving up the religious, but still coming with these religious values and education. Again, it's a very extreme way to describe it, but I'm just sharing with you to say, this is one of the challenges. So, so, for sure, if there is one thing I, ca- I can say for sure about Haredim, it's a society of chesed, and again, it's a Jewish value. Shlosha, the, the, the Chazal said one of the, the three ways to evaluate, evaluate if someone is a, you have a Jewish roots, he's vayishanim, gomlei chasadim, rachmanim, vayishanim, and gomlei chasadim. People with pity, shy people, like modest people, and people who like 
to, to give and to, to make chesed. So with the Haredi society, to, give, to make chesed, it's like obvious. You're waking up in the morning and all you, you see is just how we can make, help people, give tzedakah, uh, uh, do, volunteer and doing. So this is something that for sure, uh, when you're talking about Haredi, Haredi people, I'll give you just another example. I went with my mother to the beach last Thursday evening. You know, by the evening, I can't go in, during the day with her to the beach. But she likes to go to the beach, so she asked me to take her to Rishon Lezion. So it was like, like around the sunset, and we came there, we sat there. And then by the evening, I saw slowly, slowly, Haredi families are coming because the beach is becoming empty. And they want to, s- to sit next to the beach in a modest way. So they're coming after that the people are going home. So I saw family after family coming. And a Haredi guy came, and he saw the plastic chairs there, okay? Mm-hmm. And he wanted to take a chair but was nobody there that he can rent the chair from them. So he asked a secular guy who was sitting next to me, and he said, where I should go to pay to take these chairs? Yeah. And the guy said, there's nobody here. And the Haredi guy said, so I can't take it, it's a gazelle. It's like theft. Yeah, I can. So, and, and the guy said, no, you know, God sent it to you, you can take it for free. I can see even, <laughs> I, I can see even in my people someone can come to me before Yom Kippur employees working for Mishpacha and said I just want to ask you forgiveness because I'm afraid that one day I printed something for my personal use so I used three papers without asking asking permission so you see that the values of these people of mm. being the morality mm. and it's, it's a very high level. You know, there is nothing you can compare. And you want to bring these people to the cynical world of said that we, we just care to see how we can maximize our benefits and people who still care about the five minutes. And, and, and I heard from many of my friends that Haredi employees, she goes to her boss and by the end of the day she said, I just want you to take off uh, five minutes from my day because I had a private call uh, to call to my family. It's, yeah. Who cares about mm-hmm. it? Um, I'm, I'm talking to my friends in the high-tech industry. So they said the Haredi women, they don't go to lunch in the middle of the day. When they're coming to work, they're coming to work and they're, they will stay. They're very efficient because they're juggling. They have. So I said they're not uh, um, going to Facebook and Instagram. They're coming, doing their job, and, and they're very committed to what they're doing. So I think this is kind that every employer would like to have in right. his company right. Some people that are still have the naive mode of, of morality <laughs> and, and values. Right. Um, so that, that's, that, that's something I think, again, Haredim are bringing to the, to the new and the, and the very challenging and technology so, work some old-fashioned values. I love this because, so when we talk about GDP, for example, something that I've been realizing, cause, so I, I quit my job a year ago and um, sort of doing this on my own trying to be entrepreneurial about it. And what I realized is the nicer you are, so the, 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 the harder, the, the more integrity you display, the more opportunities open up to you. Mm-hmm. And that's wonderful. I mean, if that's really the case, that, you know, the Haredim are pumping out an army of super in, in, um, moral people, and you put them out in the modern world, with, and you match them with the crazy technology, that these are the kinds of people you'd actually want to have Absolutely. in charge of all this stuff. Absolutely. So long as they don't go, you know, <laughs> authoritarian and. <laughs> no, I, I, I agree with you. That, that's why that. It's, it's very yeah, yeah. Th- that's why I really feel uh, very optimistic about. We we have so much to gain from creating a real partnership between Haredi and Haredi, and what I'm trying to do in the past ten and eleven years when I started my my, my uh, um, foundation and my, and my think tank is really to try to build models that it's a win-win model. Meaning, okay, we understand you already, what are your values? And, yeah. and I don't want you to give up your values because we believe, and again, I'm, this, I, I'm trying to, 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 to convince people that we believe that not just that we don't care about your values. No, we appreciate your values mm-hmm. and we want to make sure that you will continue your values because this is a kind of, of a person or human being or, or, or a Jew or a Jewish people that we believe can bring something to the atmosphere, to the, yeah. to, to the, to the public sphere. But on the other hand, we want to create a very um, secure way of creating a trust 
between between the parties and that's related to the issues that you mentioned okay so okay you're doing great but it's about time once you're not anymore a small minority that you will participate the conversation yeah. about the concerns and the challenges of the of the future of so the so where metaphysics and and the real world so policy connect is if if there are this this um, community of people that have these values and they are the highest values right of, of of integrity and love and hard work you would expect those people to be the most productive the most successful people in in the broader population group now success can be measured in many ways but mm-hmm. in terms of uh, impact on the lives of the the most amount of people positive impact on the most of most amount of people the Haredim would be in many cases the least successful mm-hmm. in the society so mm-hmm. there is some sort of a disconnect Absolutely. here between the values that you hold how they resonate in the real world and then obviously the impact like w- one should expect actually the opposite that the Haredim would be the most successful if that were the case in, in some areas they are very successful as you you mentioned sure. about uh, satisfaction of life right. even longevity which is by the way amazing we, we have a study mm. which shows in general in the world in Israel and in, in, in the in, in the world in general there is a correlation between longevity and your socioeconomic level mm. meaning the, the the lowest clusters are living shorter and the highest classes are living I'll show you later the, the chart okay the only exceptions are the Haredi funny you can see a low drum like poor cities living less years yeah Ramata Sharon Herzelia living like the in, in the tens uh, <laughs> level yeah and the only ex- and the only the outlier are the the Haredi yeah. who are mm-hmm. competing with with the highest level of the of this, meaning it's even works physically by bio, biologically it That's works so not just in terms talking about uh, uh, satisfaction life you can say you know you know you're a drunk people you know you like you know you're you are you're, you're happy no I'm not happy I'm, I'm talking about functionality I'm talking about yeah. the, the way of life and by the way it's probably what you said of when you retire right when you get in your old age you're still you're still passionate you're still energetic because absolutely. and there's so many of you <laughs> you're never alone yeah <laughs> again it's a very strong point yeah also in terms of uh, loneliness yeah. yeah so we had the we had the conference few years ago and when he demonstrated those studies talking about health and we had professor Yonatan Levy from Shari Tzedek and okay. some other experts and mm-hmm. we asked them first is this is what you're saying so, absolutely and we said it has to do with the subjective meaning people are more happy so or, or they're ready to even suffer because they like to live and he said it's a combination it has to do with the attitude and Yes, they appreciate life, they have meaning in life, but also in terms of practicalities. The way that the community, the, first the family, so you never you're never alone. you're going to the synagogue every day. I'm going to the synagogue. I, I am spraying with I, until a few years ago I had the Auschwitz survivor coming to our synagogue every day. He was never alone. Mm-hmm. He was never he, every day came. met the people people ask him when he was missing one day so you knew that to, you, you go to ask what's going on with him but not just in terms to go to ask always he felt pa- someone cares about him appreciate yeah. him respect yeah. him right already society very respecting uh, elderly people right we have to stand up when elderly person walks uh, next to you mm. so so he said it's a combination between attitude meaning in life but also practicality so another example about what already can contribute is the Let's talk about the, the, the welfare system of the Haredi world. Or in general, there is the Kupot Zdaka in every community, mm-hmm. in every neighborhood, not community, in every neighborhood. And I'm living in, in, in a big neighborhood in Yerushalayim, so in every sub-neighborhood, Ramot, which is divided to two, two uh, areas. So in every, every sub-neighborhood, there is Kupot Zdaka, there is the charity system, The people in charge of the charity and they know in every synagogue there is representative who knows who is the people who are the needy people who need something who is now facing a crisis it's such an efficient way of, of providing welfare and it's amazing to see how it works and those people are all of them are volunteers now but I'm getting paid for it by the way none of them even get any education to be a social worker etc but there are the top top social workers I just went to the synagogue and 
uh, yesterday and I met one of the people in the neighborhood that I'm living now because we're doing renovation. And he came to me, Ellie, I'm doing a program for kids who their parents, uh, one of the parents is having a can- cancer and I need, how much he asked me? A hundred tickets for swimming pool to take these kids. So he knows by the community who, who, are the, who needs something, how can we provide them solutions and et cetera. And this is an amazing wow. operation, the, yeah. way, the, way, the, the, the way it works. And think about the benefit that he feels for himself of, I'm giving, I'm, I'm helping giving. facilitate. And, and by the way, yeah. we feel totally a sense of a real partnership. I don't feel mm. that I am the giver and he's the schnorrer. No, I, I thank him you so much for, to yeah. help me to get an opportunity to do something meaningful. And you know, and you know where your And I can trust him. I don't have to check him. I don't have to check right. what he's You're, doing with the money. But you, but you also know where your resource is, like the impact that it's going to have directly. Absol- yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Uh, another example about the, the way that the, the, the health system works in the Haredi world. You have so many organizations. What so, do you mean? Well, so meaning, I'll give you an ex- a story, another story. Yeah. Um, I have a neighbor, a family with six kids, that the father was, uh, at that time, Baruch Hashem, he recovered, but I'm talking about a year ago, he was facing a cancer in his mouth. They have six kids. One of the daughters is a very, very a strong um, autistic, autistic in a very, very high level, meaning she, you, you can't let her stay for a moment without, without uh, supervision. And they have another girl that she's suffering from uh, epilepsy, but a very, very strong, meaning every few weeks an ambulance comes, takes her to the hospital, because once she gets, sometimes when she's getting an epileptic attack, she, she had to go to the hospital. Okay. And, and medicine didn't work so well, so they finally find that she can take uh, cannabis, uh, mm-hmm. some oil drops, and that helps, uh, helps her to keep balance. Okay. She called me one Mutzai Shabbat, you know, Shabbat night, and she said they came back from a vacation, and the bottle was broken, and they don't have now uh, the cannabis, and she needed emergency. She, she, you know, yeah. it's, it's like pikuach uh, nefesh. It's like to save the life. So she said, she called the kupat cholim. She called the pharmacy and they asked to get and said, we can't give it to you because it's a, it's a drug. So you have to get uh, approve, approval by the, by the police. So we can't give oh, it wow. to you. Oh, wow. Okay. She called the police. Nobody knows what she's, she has to do. She said, I'm gonna, yeah, I know that you're a very connected person. Can you try to help me? So I connected my sister-in-law that she used to work by Hadassah Hospital, and she know, like in the community relationship, another guy who works for us at the institute that used to work for the Minister of uh, Health. Okay. And within less than an hour, a top officer came specially to their home to interview them to see how he can help them. By the way, he didn't find what he should do, but they find the person who came. An hour later, they find through, they start to use their chain of people or organizations all over, and they find in Batyam and Rehovo, two places, they find the exact, uh, uh, the exact formula of the cannabis they're looking for, someone was, got, got left over. Yeah. And an hour later, through having another organization, we have thousands of volunteers who are connected mm-hmm. through WhatsApp, so they find someone who is going to deliver it from Rehovot to their home. So in three hours, they got it. Took them. By the way, it took three days to get the the the, the permit, and, and and from the from the pharmacy. This is an amazing machine of of community of but relation. You, but but I, I will say that that is a very typically Israeli story, not just Israeli Haredi. plus Haredi. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no, but Israelis are also just so willing to that, that's to why I'm, I'm surprised by your secular jur- journalist friend who said hey he can't find any secular no, no. With I, morals. I, I know uh, no the, the reason why i mentioned the story wasn't to to say the first half of what he was saying is to say to mention more his observation about the second half he said what i find in my community when i see like people who have very special attitudes most of them are people who are coming from uh, religious education that uh-huh. was uh-huh. that was his point okay I, I agree with you it's a very israeli but you have Haredi society is really a startup nation in terms of creating mo- such an amazing models and efficient models, and not just how you can get cannabis from Rehovo to Jerusalem. You can bring from Melbourne to Johannesburg yeah. in less than 24 hours, again, using this chain yeah. of community. So yeah. it's not just yeah. in terms of willingness, it's also in terms of efficient, how how it's going. So for me, all I had to do is to find two people 
that I know. And through these people, they were using their chain of people. And Amazing. It happen. So again, imagine what will happen if we will really feel that it's not just about how we can help. So we already, when we have a problem, we know you can mm. pick up the telephone, someone will help you. Mm-hmm. I want to give the other side of the story. I met with a friend of mine, Yonatan Adiri. He's a very into the high tech. Uh, you know Yonatan? He's a friend of mine. So I love yes, that so man. So send Yonatan regards. Yes. And you know, we discuss about uh, some opportunities, how to build something for high tech for okay, Haredi, okay. which I was involved. And huh. he said to me, Ellie, you have to know, I really, really admire and appreciate the welfare of the Haredi society, the welfare system. Okay. And the health system. And we have so many volunteers, thousands of volunteers who are going and bringing food and think, singing. And, and by the way, uh, are contributing uh, blood cells and, and, and kidney, whatever. Mm-hmm. But he said, Jonathan said, but at the end of the day, we need doctors, we need hospitals, mm. we need uh, re- rental, uh, rentologists. How is it? Rentgen. X rays, no? Uh, okay, X rays. So we need X ray and we. So with all due respect to what Haredi were bringing to the table, but we need also scientists and we need professionals. Right. And I think this is exactly the challenge, meaning yeah. Haredi have so much to bring to the table and it's about time just to see the big picture and said, okay, you Haredi tell us what you can bring to the table, but I want you Haredi also to at least open one eye to see the big the picture yeah, yeah, yeah. and yeah. to see, okay, what with your very unique and special values, what can you bring to something to be more that that can be sustainable and work for not just to to do good things but also to be uh, to build the future of the the Israeli economy and and security so and wh- the numbers so far I actually read this last night um, this was Israel Democracy Institute but um, that 20 years ago it was a third of ultra orthodox men worked and today it's more than 50 percent mm-hmm And 20 years ago, it was half of women, and now it's more than 80%, mm-hmm. which is pretty, it's a huge improvement mm-hmm. over mm-hmm. T- not a, such a long period of time. But still, you know, half of men don't work, which is bizarre. <laughs> as a guy, I, you know, I, yeah. I wouldn't know what to do with myself if I didn't work. Again, as I said, knowing what to do with yourself, it's not a problem for a Haredi person. Well, He works in the morning. <laughs> see, really, right, if, let's right. say, he's, he's, he's unemployed, okay? Let's yeah. say it's not... Uh, So the next day, he, will, he won't sit at home. Most of them will go in the morning and find out Chavruta, someone they can and sit study. and learn, and yeah. they're going back to their, their studies until yeah. they will find a job. Yeah. But I agree with you that this is definitely the challenge, and the question is, and again, over the past 75 years, so the contribution of this situation was, I think we have the two sides contribution, meaning Haredim asked, please leave us alone, Let us rebuild our community in our own way. We'll try as minimum as possible to bother you. you know, okay, just okay. let us leave. Which in, in terms of Chazal, we call it Yavne V'chachamea. It's Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakai by the destruction of the, of the second temple. Um, so he was asking to go out from the city of Jerusalem. And then the, the Kaysar asked him, the, 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 the Roman... Uh, imperator asked him, so what do you want? And he said, please give me a place that I can start my yeshiva. That's all. I don't, hmm. need, I don't need territories. I don't need anything. I, didn't, I need Yavnu Chachamea. And this became a phrase of understanding the Haredi attitude. Please let us rebuild our own society. It will try as minimum as possible to bother you. From the state perspective, they say the same. You know, we are now in the trend of building the country. We don't want you Haredim to walk between us too much. We want the army to be the way we want the army to be, we want the academia to be the way we want academia to be. Yeah. And we, we can leave you aside as long as you won't bother us. Now the problem starts to be a serious problem because, and, and I'll give you just one example, talking about the army. In the past 10 or 15 years, when I'm talking to my friends about the issue, of, which, which is a real issue about Haredim not participating in, almost not participating in the army or the challenges of the security of Israel, So I heard the following. They said, really, we don't need Haredim in the army, and we don't even want them in the army. Not just we don't need them. We don't want them in the army because I'm not sure. This was, I was told many times by my friends. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure that an army that Haredim will join in big numbers will be an army that I want my daughter to go. Mm. So we were, finally were able to build a liberal, progressive, uh, very pro-women service, and etc. in the army. And we understand that one Haredim will join in big numbers, 
that won't be the solution. That will be really a big problem. So you already, we can leave, stay aside, okay? Mm. But at least do something. So go to do national service. And I, I think this is exactly what, where you're missing the understanding and the sensitivity of the Haredi society because what you're saying is the following. We're not fighting with you because there is security needs. By the way, I believe that there is security needs because if you're looking at the trend for 20 years from now, and if, if every fourth child today in the first grade in the Jewish school is a Haredi boy, so you don't have to be a genius to understand that we have a challenge in 20 yeah. years from now, mm -hmm. and it's about time to address and to discuss the challenge. But the conversation is, no, 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 we don't, we are not asking you Haredim to participate, and we don't even want you to participate, which is even worse. Saying we don't need you, it's okay. Well, I don't know, it depends who you ask, right? Because there, there's, there's a, a very large swath of the Israeli public that says we do want them to bear the b burden of army service. I'm, I'm telling you, I was involved in many, many groups and conversation with people and even with experts who are dealing with this. And this is in general the common these meaning. Are, these are military they, experts. Meaning, yeah, military mm -hmm. experts mm -hmm. and politicians and, 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 and social activists. Meaning the point is the following. They're saying, they don't, they don't say, no, we don't, you, you can do whatever you want. They yeah. said, we, we care about the, the, the inequality. We care about sharing the burden. But... We're not trying to build solutions how you already can contribute to the army because we don't want you the army because we want you to stay mm -hmm. to stay away. Mm -hmm. So go do you know for for the lowest level go do national service. And I said, hey, why not to talk about security? Meaning, can we have the conversation about security? This is a conversation that I'm trying sure. now, and I have I'm having this conversation. And it affects you as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm saying is, is security is, is a secular problem. It's not. It's not, <laughs> right. it's not our state and our nation. Yeah. But even worse, to say to Haredi, and I said, once you're coming to the rabbis and to the leaders, and he said, listen, we see the trends, we see the demographic, we see the threats all around, and we, based on this forecast, we need to rebuild the structure of, of which talents and how many we need to get to the army. This is one kind of conversation. But the conversation of having Haredi in the army started when the army is struggling with having too many people and, and always the conversation is how we, can we short shorten the period of time that people are going to the army mm -hmm. and at the same time saying why you are not going to the army which means and I didn't study Liba but I still understand logic which means <laughs> that the problem is not that the army have a shortage of real people we care about something else again back to the point that I said we care about the way that you already decided that you want to leave, mm -hmm. and you're not taking care about the needs of the states, you're not part of it, but we don't want you to be part of it because once your voice will be heard, yeah. we won't feel comfortable because we're not ready yet to have a real conversation yeah. because we have to give up. And you see, by the way, the problem that today the yeshivot has dealt have with the army. I just heard a few months ago that Rabbi Yaakov Meidan, the head of uh, Yeshivat Gush Etzion, and they said with the mixed gender policy of the army, even them, that they are very open-minded and modern people who are sending their kids as, as really a religious mission to the army, said, we really have a problem and I won't recommend to my boys to continue to go to different kinds of uh, professions in the army because of this issue. So it's really become... What is the issue, sorry? A mixed gender uh, service. The mixed okay. gender service, which is a strong agenda today in the liberal, progressive, uh, Israeli uh, uh, attitude of uh, serving... And I said, again, I have nothing against it. You know, people, if people want to have this opportunity, but you have to watch, what's the price? So meaning you are, in a way, rejecting people and saying, I don't respect your life. I respect the, the values of... of uh, but what, of is, what, is the, what, is, what is the problem exactly? Because... Mm -hmm. Map it up, okay. Um, so what, what is exactly the, the, the problem? Because you're, we're in an office now. There's women here. You work. Yeah, we're not, you know, always. By the way, was mixed service in the army, but right. uh, getting getting them to fight and to sleep together, sleep meaning in the same tent, and and it's it's really becoming. But I don't the think issue. that 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 really. Uh, that's part of the case. Yeah, I mean, when I was in the army, as brief a period I was, I didn't sleep in a tent with women. It was no, it was all guys. Because when you were in the army, mm -hmm. it was very few, if at all. Uh, uh, women who were in the, I don't know, you call it in Kravi. Combat units, yeah. Okay. yeah. And so always you have officers and you have uh, intelligence and you have, uh, you know, top jobs. But but to be in the field together, yeah, it's something that really 
creating a big issue with religious people and not just with Haredim, with religious people. Right, 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 right. That's why I quote Rabbi Yaakov Meidan. So I'm saying, but it's just one example. We can argue where, whether it's, uh, we have a solution. We don't have, maybe we'll have, make a special units for, for people who, who don't want to have mixed yeah. gender. But all I'm saying is, and this is the point that I was trying to get to, is to say, we don't really want you Haredim in the army because... You know, you're coming with your values and, and demands and needs and culture and women singing. We have so many issues. So uh, mm. we have enough with you in, 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 in the citizen life. Why, why we, don't, <laughs> we need it to be the army? Mm. But please close your Gemara and go to do two years, I don't know, to help elderly people, yeah. to work in a hospital, to bring files from the archive to the doctors. Right. And this is such a disrespect to their values, meaning what you are saying I totally don't respect what you're doing at Yeshiva, meaning studying Torah as a mission of the Jewish people. And I want you to do something meaningful. So if you're asking Haredim to join because we have to do something for the security of Israel, makes sense. But you're saying, no, no, we don't need to participate in the security of Israel, but we need to do something productive, well, meaningful, serving it, the state. It's not, it's not about productivity for its own sake. It's about national service. It's about... It's about the army, the whole melting pot thing is that everyone goes in there and they all get a chance to see people from all over the country and they get, to, okay, now we understand who these people are in the country, what we are fighting for, right? Because it's not just the, the neighborhood, little small corner of this country. that you, it's, it's everyone, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, okay, if not the army, then national service, <laughs> you're going around and, and then you By see... By the way, it. national service doesn't serve the need to talk because anyway, national service are not going to be in the melting pot of, of being. No, but it takes you society. out from your corner of, of this country and but puts that's you in exactly else. you're touching yeah. the, 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 the exposed nerves of the Haredi society because right. talking about your participation in the security of Israel is one issue. Talking about we have a value that you need to serve the country. But yeah. Haredi serve the country means nothing. I serve the Jewish people by studying Torah. I make sure that the, the continuation of the Jewish people will continue because there is people who are devoted to Torah. So this is where we're talking two different mm, languages. Yeah, Again, yeah, I'm not saying yeah, yeah. who is right and who is wrong, yeah. but without understanding that this is a conversation. So why Haredim have problem with volunteering? They're the best volunteers. So they don't have a problem with... And this is where also where it gets nasty because it's like we're saying, we're making a judgment on your life saying... No, 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 get real, get serious. Mm-hmm. That's not serving the Jewish people. And you're like, well, no, you get serious, and, right? And by the way, being yeah. serious is to bring files from the archive to the to the nurse in the hospital. Come on. S- devoting 12 years a day in, in, in sitting and learning is much more meaningful from a Haredi perspective. So this is really where we have to find the yeah. ways how Haredi will, can really contribute to the solutions and the it's needs. It's unfortunate that we, uh, we, we, <laughs> we run out of time because that... I think we've, we've finally gotten somewhere. <laughs> can we can we have five more minutes? Five, ten more minutes? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> five, ten more minutes? <laughs> okay. I'm, right. I'm over my other meeting, but uh, okay. We'll yeah? All right. I'll try to make this quick. Okay. Because mm-hmm. we're, we're now, we've, we've, we've arrived at the, at the heart of the fight, right? It's, it's this competing judgments on how to live the best judgments life. Judgments and even values. We see our values, let's say democracy and, yeah. and, 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 yeah, 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 and Torah. Yeah, yeah. Where, how do we reconcile this? How do we, how do we fit these, these pieces of the puzzle together? Because if, if this, is the, this is the frightening part, if these two pieces are totally irreconcilable, then the people who are screaming civil war, you know, maybe not now, but in 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, when the numbers just become what they are, undeniable, inevitable, that's where we're going to end up. So it's, it is super important that we figure this out right now and not wait anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, that's exactly what I'm trying to do in the past uh, 10 years. I'm devoting most, okay. of, my, most <laughs> of my time yeah. to really the effort to trying to build bridges or really to build and models that can work and, and preserve the the unique value proposition of each of the parts and yeah. building together something. And I think in order to build together, first you have to agree about your goals. And, and the goal yeah. is, is first to make sure that we as Jewish people can continue before talking about whether we should serve the country in order to preserve the... Um, where were we? Um... Look, the, okay, 
it's it's a well, there's a break. You, you, know, you ask me. There's you a ask breakdown me? in communication, I think, yeah. between these two communities, exactly. and how how we how we um, how we possibly um, fix this. That 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 seems to be the most productive part. Absolutely. So I'm saying again, I have two assumptions. A, that we need each other in order to continue to sure. be here as a Jewish people. Yeah. Uh, for the sake of the state of Israel, and especially for the sake of the Jewish people, each part of this Jewish community is super, super crucial and relevant for our future. None of us can really make, make, uh, build a solution that can, can, can be sustainable without the other part. And not just because the seculars are more working, Haredim more studying Torah. Each of us brings to the table values and, and attitudes and, 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 and special, special uh, advantages. But the first step is first to understand, I said, Sur Merai and Asetov, First, to understand that part of the problem that we're facing over the past 75 years, that always below the need, we were fighting about narratives. So instead of trying to build solutions, sustainable solutions, always in every decision, we said, okay, but we have a big fight about what Jewish identity means, Mm -hmm. what really means to contribute or Mm -hmm. to to do, so whether you should serve the country or you should sacrifice your life to study Torah. Yeah. And, and as someone who is dealing with public policy over the past 10 years, it's, it's always the problem when I'm talking even to professionals to try to help them to distinguish between when they're talking about the issue and the solution and when they're talking about the narrative. Mm. Okay, and, and I don't want to bring it to example because we're already yeah, too late, yeah, but yeah. it's in every issue, meaning first to understand that we are still the two communities are unsecure of fighting about the narrative. What does it mean to be a good Jew? A oh, good yeah. Jew means there you go. to serve the country, to work, and, 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 and to be successful, and to be liberal and progressive and whatever. Or to a real Jew means to devote to Torah and to do chesed and, and whatever. And I think the solution will start, A, with, with recognizing that this is the issue, meaning talking about solutions should be like a good mediator. Let's talk about the mutual interest and how we can really build. And secondly, that each part will learn to appreciate other side contribution. Yeah. We can't live in a country without the devotion of young people, boys and girls who are ready to go to the army and sacrifice their lives. And this is part of our future. And we should be always grateful and pray for their success and appreciate what they are doing. And we, can't have, we don't have a future for the Jewish people if we won't have people who are devoting their lives to continue to make sure the Jewish Jewish life is continuing. Once we will come to the conversation with a real mutual appreciation, I think we can start to then to have a conversation about the practicalities, how we can really benefit from each other. And I see this is why I'm so optimistic because practically when I'm dealing with these issues, I see there is so much that can be done. I mentioned welfare and health and, and, and chesed and so many areas thinking, different way of thinking yeah. that already you have. And this is... I want to close with an yeah. optimistic... Um, Let's do that. Um, so first of all, thank you for all you do. And uh, I, I, I appreciate the spirit that you, that you bring to what you do and the mission that you have, right? You said you're mission-oriented, so it's, it, it really shows. And um, let this be the first conversation of men between us because I'll that's be the only way forward, right? Thank you so much. I'll be more than happy. Thank you, Kobe. Bye, Eddie.